It's an immense pleasure for me to welcome you to this special lecture inserted in the webinar series of the graduate program in physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the microphone and camera turned off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed in the end, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. The questions can be made using the chat in this virtual room and also in the YouTube. Today, we have the great honor to listen to Professor John Cromwell Mather, who was awarded with the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics, together with George Smoot, for their discovery of the black body form and anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Our special guest is senior scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the United States of America. Apart from the Nobel Prize in Physics, Professor Mather Research has been honored with the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics from the Franklin Institute in 1999, the Gold Medal from the Prime Minister of India in 2009, the Daniel Challonge Medal from the Observatoire de Paris in France in 2011, and numerous other awards. He is honorary life member of the Optical Society, fellow of the American Physical Society, the Society of Photo of Optical Instrumentation Engineers, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Sciences of the United States, and has various other distinctions in academies and scientific societies. Progress towards opening the infrared treasure chest with James Webb Space Telescope is what Professor John Matter will tell us about today, and I should not make you wait longer to listen to him. Professor John Matter, thank you very much once again for having accepted our invitation, and from this moment on, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Professor Crispino. It's a lovely opportunity to show you what we've been working on lately, and uh, also, as I'm showing you here, the, uh, the first slide of my package, um, I point out that uh, projects like this are immense. Huge numbers of people have been working on these things. Uh, when a Nobel Prize is given to a project like what we did before on the Cosmic Background Explorer mission, that was the result of 1,500 people working together. Uh, this new telescope is at least 10,000 people have worked on it. Um, just to get this far. And there will be a possibility for all uh, uh, professional astronomers to work uh, with it in the future. So uh, just to give you a sense of how enormous these things are, and, a, and a, an award or a prize really represents the work of an immense number of people. So what we are showing you here are a few things. Uh, number one, this is a project of three international space agencies, and NASA is the lead agency but we have very large contributions from the European and Canadian space agencies. Um, the uh, picture in the middle shows you the gigantic golden hexagon of the mirror. The primary mirror is 6.5 meters across, about 6.6 uh, .6 meters to corner to corner. Uh, it is protected by a five layer umbrella, a sunshade we call it. Uh, which we see here in the picture as five sort of gray layers of thin plastic. Uh, and it is out there in space now. And of course, this is a view which you could never see because now the telescope is completely in the dark. Um, so uh, this is just the beginning to show you what we have accomplished. Uh, now I want to show you how we got it there uh, just to begin. So uh, this is what, uh, a short version of what it took to build it and fly it. So uh, first, we built the telescope. Um, and we built it out of all those uh, 18 golden hexagons, along with an instrument package, which in this picture has already been uh, through a test program. So we know that it works. Um, uh, the telescope was uh, assembled at Goddard Space Flight Center, but pieces came from around the country. Um, after we had completed putting it together, we put it in a plastic tent and carried it around to the vibration uh, to a test area where we could apply a vibration similar to what would be experienced during a rocket launch. And then we were done with that. We put it in a shipping container uh, and put it in an airplane and flew it from Maryland in the United States down to Houston uh, in, in also in the United States, where it was tested in the gigantic vacuum tank, uh, the same one that was used 
uh, for the Apollo astronauts to uh, practice walking down a small ladder onto the surface of the moon back in the 1960s. Uh, we learned that it worked. Uh, we had a few worries we tried to take care of. And um, anyway, we were very happy with that. By the way, the uh, test occurred during the middle of a Hurricane Harvey, where well over one meter of rain fell on the city at that same time. Uh, but the telescope, of course, was inside a vacuum tank and it was fine. When we were finished with the vacuum tank testing, we put the telescope back in the airplane, uh, flew it out to California uh, near Los Angeles, where it um, was uh, attached to the rest of the observatory. What you see here is a small picture of a very large sunshade. The sunshade is about as large as a tennis court. Uh, then when it was all put together, uh, we unfolded it one last time. We vibrated it one last time. And we uh, then put it in a ship and sent it through the Panama Canal all the way to the launch site in uh, French Guiana, uh, very close to where you are, much closer than I am at any rate. And uh, then the uh, same truck came out again. Uh, it was took the telescope and the whole observatory over to the launch facility. And you see here a small picture with the folded up telescope in the top of the Ariane 5 rocket, which by the way is provided by the European Space Agency from the Ariane Spas uh, commercial rocket company in France. So then it was launched on Christmas day, December 25, and it went right as planned. The orbit was essentially perfect, went all the way to the desired place in, uh, in space. And it is now completely unfolded, and it looks like this in space, except, of course, that it's dark out there and you couldn't really see it. So that's just a short version of what it takes. Uh, there's no way I can convey to you the amount of labor and ingenuity and determination that it took uh, the 10,000 people to solve every technical problem as it occurred. So a few last minute pictures here are telescope uh, pictures at the launch facility in French Guiana. Uh, you can see a little bit of perspective here. And uh, it's beautiful. Uh, then there's a, a rocket launch picture. Uh, that's our very own rocket going up on December 25. Uh, there's a central uh, rocket, which is of chem uh, fueled by liquid fuel, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, and on the outside are two solid rocket bo boosters. Very uh, well-regarded uh, rocket. It's had about 100 successful launches. So we are now 25 days after launch. The picture in the lower left, uh, sorry, on the left, is the telescope or observatory as it is leaving uh, the rocket. I, there was a small camera at the top of the launcher, and uh, they got this picture. Moments after this, the uh, solar panels unfolded, and we were very happy to know that the telescope was well on its way to Lagrange Point. So you can watch the, uh, the uh, deployment on our website. You can see all of the details of what it looks like each different day. Uh, now it is all completely unfolded. Uh, the, the mirrors are in place, the secondary mirror is unfolded, the transmitter antenna is out, uh, all of those things are completed and done. And so there uh, are very few uh, mechanical things left to be accomplished, except for focusing the telescope itself. So where is it? It's almost all the way there to the Lagrange point. Uh, so we are there at day 25 on this graphic. Uh, so we're more than three quarters of the way to the Lagrange point distance, which is about 1.5 million kilometers. 94% uh, of the way there. We're not moving very fast anymore. We are coasting uh, effectively to the top of the hill and we will get uh, close to the top and then we will adjust the orbit in about three more days, three or four. So actually it was possible to observe the telescope uh, from the ground. This is a, a amateur astronomer's uh, picture, I believe. Uh, it, uh, watching, watching the telescope go. It is currently uh, fairly far south of the ecliptic, uh, and I'm not sure what constellation this is. 
Uh, but anyway, people that know how to find things can do this and actually watch the telescope out there. Now, uh, here is what is coming for us. We have uh, finished uh, the first uh, uh, 25 days of the commissioning process, but it takes altogether uh, six months. And so uh, we've got the telescope unfolded. Uh, we will soon adjust the orbit and start turning on the uh, the near infrared, infrared camera when its temperature comes down enough. And then we will start looking for um, images of a bright star so that we can focus the telescope on a bright star. Uh, after that, then after enough of the instruments are working, then we start aligning the camera, the telescope to work with all three of the instruments. And uh, the last one to really come on is the mid infrared instrument. Uh, it comes on after day about 100. Then uh, the, the uh, final commissioning of the instruments themselves starts around day 125. So that's to give you an idea of what we have to do. Um, and so far, we're doing it very well. We're exactly on schedule or even uh, just a little bit ahead. The, uh, yep, very happy about that. So where are we going? We are going, going to orbit around the Sun-Earth Lagrange point. Uh, the Lagrange point 2 orbit is actually a little bit unstable. We do occasionally need to fire rocket engines to stay close enough. Um, the orbit we choose is not actually at the Lagrange point. Um, we avoid it for two reasons. One is that it takes more energy to get to it. And the other is um, we really don't want to be in the shadow of the Earth. We need the solar electricity from the solar panels to power the observatory. So this is called the Lagrange point two. Uh, there are five of them, and these are all places in which the combined gravitation of the sun and the earth will pull the uh, payload around the sun once a year and keep it in about the right place. So uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, Lagrange Point 1, by the way, is also the home for several uh, telescopes and observatories. They are good for looking back towards the earth from L1. So now I want to go back to a little bit of science. Uh, the sort of general theme that people have for the Webb telescope is, how did we get here? Uh, what uh, happened after the Big Bang? Uh, what are the processes that brought uh, the uh, solar system into existence uh, from the primordial material? So um, here we just summarize a little bit of that. The expanding universe, we believe, started out very smooth and very hot. Um, and there's uh, much to be thought about. It's, uh, pretty unknown what really happened. At any rate, we have learned that it was unstable in many, many ways, especially uh, from gravitation. Gravitation is the weakest force of all in physics, but it is the only one which reaches across uh, effectively infinite distances and is able to stop the expansion of the, uh, of the material uh, locally and pull it back and turn it into objects like galaxies or stars. And so we're here because of that. Um, gravitation can do that. Um, the universe is immense. It is uh, usually assumed to be infinite, although that's not provable because we can't possibly observe infinity. Uh, we can only observe the part of the universe that is within sight uh, in the range of time uh, that we have. So if the universe has an age of about 13.8 billion years, then you cannot see the entire thing. You can only see uh, of the distance away that light has traveled in that period of time. Uh, more locally, we've learned about uh, the complexity of our world and how uh, DNA is a digital code that uh, governs the process of life. And of course, uh, digital code has unlimited complexity. Um, there is no nothing that tells you that the digital code must be simple. Uh, we felt very happy when we learned about 1953 that it was carried in a uh, double helix molecule. And now we are able to read that molecule and see the sequence of letters. Uh, but what is the most trickier thing in this interpretation is what does it mean? So it's trying to decode an ancient language that was developed by uh, more or less random processes. Um, but it's, um, we are here because of it. Uh, people thought for a long time after Charles Darwin told us about evolution that uh, human beings were obviously superior to all others because we had we are now 
um, the survival of the fittest. But actually, I think uh, evolution theory more likely tells us now that we are the lucky uh, rather than the most fit. So um, it also means, that, of course, that our uh, our survival for the next billion years is not guaranteed. A billion years is about how much time we have before the sun gets too bright for us and it gets too warm here, regardless of what we do. Uh, and from the engineering side, we've also learned about uh, control laws and how to stabilize a system. A biologists call this homeostasis. So each of our individual cells uh, operates in such a way to maintain its identity and function over a long period of time. Uh, and when it's done with its job and is old, uh, it can reproduce and make another one that does the same thing. That's a pretty astonishing thing that biologists have understood in general terms for a long time. Uh, honestly, to really understand that is to understand the mystery of life. So uh, to summarize the physics part of this, so we have uh, four forces of nature. Quantum mechanics uh, governs three of them that we know of. Uh, and they basically say, how do the particles stick together? Uh, what are the properties of all this, the little blocks that make up everything else? Uh, and so that, uh, well, it seems to be true. Um, we do not honestly feel comfortable with the interpretation of quantum mechanics yet. Um, so, however, we can feel pretty clear about the, the more classical implications of how the, the molecules are built how they stick together, how they do things. Uh, we do have a, an excellent theory uh, due to Einstein, of course, for gravitation and relativity. Uh, from an pr astronomer's perspective, the big deal is that gravity is what governs the formation of objects from the expanding uh, original material. Um, we know from uh, basic physics um, about equilibrium thermodynamics and how to calculate binding energies and things of that sort. Uh, what's much less familiar to us um, in, in specific or in general terms is non-equilibrium thermodynamics. We seem to see that nature always finds a way to increase entropy um, when it's possible to uh, find a uh, heat flow. So heat is flowing from the sun to the earth to, to dark outer space. And that means the earth is a place with huge gradients. Energy flows. And that means uh, heat engines can spontaneously appear here on Earth. And life is an example that uh, harnesses that heat flow to maintain its own complexity. So uh, a classic example in astronomy is uh, James Jeans's problem in 1902. What does it take for a cloud of gas to turn into an object uh, to collapse under its own force? And it's basically the gravitational force has to exceed the gas pressure. So that's the easy version. Uh, the modern version requires a supercomputer to conclude all of the kinetics, uh, the, all of the chemical equations of how something to, turns into something else, and uh, including even uh, cosmic rays, magnetic fields, and all the other things. So it's not simple, uh, and it does take a computer, but we are now getting pretty good at calculating what it probably did uh, based on the Big Bang as an initial condition. So back in 1929, Edwin Hubble gave us this chart. Uh, the chart, as you know, is a plot of the distance of distant galaxies versus the velocity that they have is receding away from us. Uh, the uh, obvious conclusion is that they all started together uh, a few billion years ago. And in Hubble's case, he got the wrong answer uh, about two billion years because his distance measurements were incorrect. So. Uh, for the record, we should be always calling this the Hubble Lemaitre Law because Georges Lemaitre, a uh, physicist who was also a Belgian uh, parish priest in the Catholic Church, uh, worked out that this should be true uh, based on Einstein's equations. And people didn't believe him until uh, Hubble made the graph. But uh, Lemaitre actually did this work first. Uh, he didn't, on the other hand, yet have the observations that Hubble made showing that the Andromeda Nebula has uh, variable stars, Cepheid variable stars, that can be used as proof that indeed the, the Andromeda Nebula is very distant. So that's from 1929. It's almost a century since we learned and became quite confident 
that the universe is expanding in this way. So um, jumping away ahead, in 1974, I was a graduate student at Berkeley. I had completed my thesis on an attempt to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, which is the primordial heat radiation cooled off to a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin. Um, my thesis project failed to function properly um, as a, it was a balloon payload sent up to high altitude to get above the interference of the Earth's atmosphere. Well, uh, in 1974, I was a brand new postdoctoral fellow at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City, and NASA asked for proposals for new satellite missions. So I uh, talked to my boss. Uh, we said, well, let's try this. Maybe we could make a space mission to do better than we can do on the ground. So this is the result. Uh, 15 years later, it was launched by NASA on a Delta rocket, and it went up and it worked. Um, and of course, the reason that it worked is that professional engineers and not just graduate students and professors were able to pursue everything that it took to make the thing like that work. As I mentioned earlier, this is a team project. 1,500 people uh, worked on it. Uh, we measured the cosmic microwave background spectrum to 50 parts per million accuracy and discovered that it had hot and cold spots in it, confirming the predictions of the Big Bang story. Um, it has been followed by two other uh, space missions and many, many ground-based experiments uh, that basically confirmed the answer that we got and, uh, and got many of the numbers much more precisely. We now can measure the par parameters of the expanding universe to a few percent accuracy which from my perspective as a young person in 1974 would have been completely impossible. Nevertheless, uh, technological process has been very rapid. So uh, here's a short version of, this, of the whole story of the expanding universe. Um, the uh, explanation that we currently like for what made it expand is that there was an early period of um, instability in which uh, the, not, the universe was not filled by particles at that point, but by a quantum mechanical field called the inflation field or inflaton field. And that field was unstable as it oscillated. Uh, it uh, produced the, the particles of nature that we see today, the baryons and the, and the uh, leptons, and uh, of course the force carrying particles like the, the Higgs boson and the photon. Uh, those were all produced from this early period of instability, along with the expansion uh, that uh, was exponential in nature for a uh, very brief period of time, but was enough to set off the conditions we now see. So as far as we can tell, there is no center and there is no edge, and the universe is now and always was infinite. That means uh, when people say the universe was compressed into a point, it is a false statement. It could not be compressed into a point. Um, you cannot change the dimensionality of the universe from three space and one time into the dimensionality of a point, which is zero dimensions. Uh, it also means there is not a first moment, although many people talk about the first moment, there is not one um, because as you try to imagine going back in time towards those very first moments, you cannot get all the way to the to the first moment because uh, we do not know what the equations ought to be. Um, you know, as you get higher and higher temperatures and densities, um, you just have to give up and say, I do not know what to imagine at those earliest times. So no, the universe did not get created. Did not We did not have something from nothing. It is not like a firecracker, which is a small explosion at a place and a time the universe itself is, uh, ex and the universe is an infinite universe expanding into itself. I would say this because uh, so many people are so confused about the idea of the expanding universe. So how do we know if it's true? Well, of course, we take pictures with, a, with our telescopes. Hubble telescope is now 31 years old, almost 32 in April, uh, and it is working well most of the time. Uh, why does it still work? Well, astronauts have been up five times to visit it, to fix its problems, to upgrade the equipment, and um, we still have control of it. Uh, there are redundant pieces of electronics in it. So if the equipment stops working someday, we say we have a backup set. 
uh, and we switch over to the backup equipment and that's why it's still going. And we hope to have it continue to go for many more years into the future. It uh, does not have fuel to be consumed and it will, if we don't do something about it, it will eventually re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. So the plan is we have to avoid that one because that would be dangerous. So uh, after the Hubble was up and repaired, people took pictures with it and they immediately thought, we know what we need to have next. We need to have a great infrared telescope that is much more powerful than the one we have already been using, the Hubble telescope. Uh, and so this is what they asked for. Um, it is a very large telescope. It is cold. Uh, that great golden hexagon operates around 50 Kelvin when it's all the way cold. It's down to about 75 Kelvin now. So it's almost all the way cold. Um, the telescope has four instruments that are provided from uh, various sources across the United States, Europe, and Canada. And it is being operated from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, um, just as we do with the Hubble Space Telescope, except this time uh, the actual controllers that send the commands to the telescope are in Baltimore. So um, the um, original plan and requirement for the observatory was that it must be able to operate for at least five years. Um, the only thing we know that will definitely stop it operating is when we run out of fuel. Uh, rocket fuel is required, and we think we might have much beyond the requirement of 10 years of scientific operations. If we're lucky, maybe 20. If we're unlucky, something else will work, will fail sooner. So that's our hope, is many good years of observations. So if you're an astronomer now, uh, you have a chance to look at what we find in the first year and write us a proposal for what to look at in the next time. So we have four major themes of scientific uh, interest. The telescope was built to observe these things. Uh, number one in the upper left corner is the idea of the first light of the universe. What are the first objects that grew from the Big Bang material? And when did they become capable of producing ultraviolet light? that would strip the electrons from the hydrogen gas that's remaining and change the, the opacity of the universe. So that probably happened about uh, uh, 100 million years after the, well, the first objects probably happened around 100 million years after the uh, expanded universe. So we might hope to see some of them. Um, that's one of our great objectives. Uh, then we think galaxies grew uh, by gravitational attraction uh, from small pieces being pulled together to, to join in, into large ones that they say the Milky Way may have been formed from a thousand smaller objects uh, colliding, merging together. So the uh, sort of beautiful, peaceful state that we see now with our, our spiral galaxy was spinning around so nicely is the result of uh, collision after collision after collision. Uh, closer to home, we'll be looking at stars being born in their uh, prime, in their dust clouds. The picture in the lower left is a picture from Hubble Telescope showing the Eagle Nebula, a place where glowing stars are uh, illuminating their birthplace, and we'll show you more later. Later, finally, uh, where did where do the planets come from, and what are they like? The picture in the lower right shows you one planet, a little white speck in the upper right corner orbiting around a bright star. Um, all that beautiful blue and gold material there is actually just glare from the star. We're interested in the star itself and in the little dot, the planet itself. So here is a summary of how the telescope itself is designed. Uh, we show you that there's a very large elliptical but almost parabolic mirror which focuses the starlight down on a small convex secondary mirror. The light is reflected into the instrument chamber. There's a third mirror which uh, improves the optical performance and, uh, and gives a much wider field of view for the telescope. Those 18 mirrors are made of beryllium. Each of them is coated with gold, a very, very thin amount. Um, and those beryllium mirrors are light enough that you could lift one yourself if we would allow it. The big challenge here is that the mirrors are very, very thin, which means 
a little, not as strong as you might like. So it was a uh, major technological invention required to be able to polish them correctly, and especially to be able to get them to be the right shape at the operating temperature of about 40 Kelvin. So we learned how to do that, and uh, we had to build a special factory just for that. So we have altogether four instruments on board. These are their properties. Uh, near infrared camera covers from 0.6 microns wavelength, which you could see as red wavelength, up to five microns. Uh, there's also a spectrometer that has three different ways to observe using a, um, a, a micro shutter array to select a hundred different targets or an integral field unit that can slice up a small area of sky and get a spectrum of each slice, or also individual slits, the more classical way of getting a spectrum. Uh, we have a selectable uh, like, mm, spectrographic resolution for this one. We have a mid-infrared instrument uh, with cameras and spectroscopy. Um, and again, uh, with an integral field unit, uh, which slices up a small square of sky it gets a spectrum of every pixel in it. Finally, the, uh, the Canadian contribution is a fine guidance sensor, which we use to lock onto a guide star, as well as a near-infrared imaging slitless spectrometer. Um, so that's how that's set up. Um, and they're all available for use by everyone in the world who sends us a proposal. So I'll give you a quick sketches of the instruments. Um, this is the near infrared camera. Uh, is uh, use mercury cadmium telluride detectors. It's cooled to about 40 Kelvin, and this one uses lenses uh, to focus the light, and it's uh, supported on a beryllium um, optical bench. So, very uh, much more compact than the purely reflective system. So that was uh, that is also is the camera that serves to focus the telescope. And there are two of them, uh, module A and B, uh, mirror images uh, to make sure that we, we are protected against a random part failure. We have a spectrometer, the near infrared spectrograph that I mentioned, which is able to select 100 different galaxies uh, to observe at the same time. Uh, it is done uh, by this instrument, which is a, a completely different technology, very complex. They decided to use a silicon carbide optical bench uh, and this time, uh, the special technological innovation was the micro shutter array, which we invented at Goddard Space Flight Center. The optical diagram in the upper right shows you how it works. There's a, uh, we focus the sky onto the array of little shutters, and then we open them up in a pattern. Uh, we have a mid-infrared -infra instrument, and again, these are lovely gold coated and they're insulated by uh, aluminized plastic uh, to keep them at the right temperature. Um, this was the, from some perspectives, the most interesting one because this was a consortium of uh, 10 different countries in Europe that built, built this along with our team at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. I thought that's so complicated that they were finished uh, first. They were the first one to be done. So here's the, uh, the diagram of the uh, Canadian instrument and the, and the uh, fine guidance sensor. So on, another different version of how to do it. Uh, you see all of these instruments have these thing called kinematic mounts, uh, which are uh, tripods uh, that are used to deal with the fact that each instrument is made of a different material and will contract a different amount as the temperature move, uh, goes down to the operating temperature. So how powerful is this observatory? It is extremely powerful. Uh, if you were a one square centimeter object at the distance of the moon from the earth, uh, we would be able to observe it. Um, it's actually also a challenge to look at very bright objects here in the solar system. Uh, so uh, we have our ways to do that uh, because we have a very generic uh, kind of control over all of the parameters of the detectors. So uh, we can observe all of the solar system from Mars on outwards. Mars is the brightest. Um, and that also means, by the way, we have to be able to track a moving object that has an ephemeris. 
if there is another interstellar comet coming through, uh, we will be able to watch it and track it as well. So just to show you some illustration of what we're going to be looking at, uh, we will be looking for and at the very first galaxies. One of the first uh, topics identified by the um, astronomers that were using the Hubble telescope was, um, please let us look farther back in time. Uh, the Hubble telescope uh, produced this beautiful picture, which is called the Hubble Deep Field. Uh, and it has uh, shown that there are very many more galaxies than people expected and that they were formed much more quickly after the Big Bang than people expected. So the answer was, please build us a telescope that can see farther back in time. To see farther back in time, we need to see longer wavelengths of infrared because the expanding universe stretches the light wavelengths out as the universe expands. So um, that's what we need. And the web version of this picture should include many more very red dots. Uh, the very red dots will be the most, most distant proto-galaxies that, that formed even before the galaxies of today. That's what we think, but it might not be. Uh, we certainly are going to be looking for them. Uh, we'll be looking for signs, first black holes, the first quasars, and to understand how did they happen as well. Here's an example of how we would use the spectrograph. Um, we take a picture of the sky, we say, these are the places that are most interesting. Uh, and we'll open up the shutters for the, uh, the spectrometer in a pattern that we can command uh, after we've identified the most interesting objects in the field of view. Uh, we will be looking into places that I showed you before. This is the, uh, the uh, Eagle Nebula, the Pyramids of Creation. But the left-hand picture is the visible wavelength picture from Hubble. The right-hand picture is the near-infrared picture, and you can see they're very different. Um, the uh, longer wavelengths of light are able to bend around a dust grain, uh, while the short wavelengths bounce off them. So um, dust opacity is much greater for the short wavelengths. And astronomers cannot see inside these beautiful clouds to see the stars being born. Uh, but we can using the infrared, and the longer the wavelength of infrared, the better. So we'll be looking inside places like this to see the new stars. Here's an animation showing the difference between uh, an infrared version and an optical version for the Hubble telescope. And we expect to see a very different version uh, with the web, which can see much longer infrared wavelengths. We'll be looking at the outer solar system and the inner solar system, everything from Mars on outwards. These are two of the most interesting targets um, because they are targets that NASA will be visiting. Uh, Europa, a satellite of Jupiter, has an ocean covered with ice. And there are places, uh, you can see the, the cracks between the blocks of ice are brown here. Um, water comes out occasionally uh, from those cracks. And we've seen those uh, water jets with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we are planning to send a space mission out there to fly through the jets of water and see if there's anything in them besides water, uh, possibly organic molecules, for instance. The Webb Telescope will be monitoring this object as well. On the right-hand side, we have a map of Titan. A Titan is a uh, satellite of uh, Saturn, and it has got a large and thick atmosphere. It has about one uh, times, about the same atmospheric uh, pressure that we have here. Gravity is much less, so that means that it's not impossible to build a helicopter. So we have a helicopter being designed that is going to be sent out there to look at this place. So this is interesting, partly because it has uh, lakes and rivers and rain uh, and surface structures, a kind of geology that's based on a very different situation. The lakes and rain are made of hydrocarbons, ethane and methane, for instance, and uh, not water. The surface under them is probably water, uh, and under that surface might possibly be a liquid water ocean, but we don't know that. So a very fascinating place to look for uh, signs of life that might be based on something very different from, uh, from our version, where uh, carbon uh, compounds uh, dissolved in water are they? Uh, are the uh, basic structure. 
So we will be looking for planets around other stars. Um, we, uh, we can take a picture and hope to see a very bright planet. We can also do this uh, transit spectroscopy. Uh, we already know from two observatories, the, uh, the uh, TESS mission and the Kepler mission, and from, uh, and from a few discoveries on the ground, we know when a planet is going to go in front of its star. So a little bit of the starlight can go through the atmosphere of a planet if it has an atmosphere and be modified on its way to our telescope. So we will be looking at about 65 of them uh, during the first year of operations. So including about 26 small Earth-sized planets and uh, a significantly larger number of larger planets, uh, we could guess that some of them will have water and that some of them might be a little bit Earth-like. But this is only the beginning. Uh, we cannot uh, get very far with this really deep question of whether there are other Earth-like planets out there or not. We will try. So what are we going to do? Uh, what are we going to show you? Uh, we have identified an early release science program where uh, people agreed that if we gave them the observing time, they would publish the data right away. And so 13 different proposals were chosen, and you can read about them uh, if you like. Uh, if you do a Google search for JWST early release science, you can find out all about them. Or you can just wait for us to announce what we've seen. Um, if you want to follow along, there is, of course, uh, a large number of ways you can track us. Uh, it's the websites that we run. But uh, for me, the quickest way to find them is just to Google uh, JWST uh, progress or blog or various other things. We post a blog about once a week saying what we are doing currently to, with the telescope. So that's uh, what I wanted to tell you about the web telescope. And now I want to move on just momentarily for a uh, short discussion of what could come next on the ground. So as you know, we are building enormous uh, telescopes on the ground, uh, at least for now. They are bigger than anything we can imagine building in space. The biggest one is not so far away from Brazil. It's the European, well, it started out as European, and now it's more international the extremely large 39 meter diameter telescope. And they're well along in constructing it. They have, I think, a thousand some uh, hexagonal glass mirrors that will be assembled to uh, create the great primary mirror. If you can imagine something 39 meters in diameter, that's not so much smaller than a football field. So the idea of that is very enchanting and very fascinating. And, and we'd say, well, what are we going to use it with? And of course, how do you compensate for being at the bottom of the atmosphere when the atmosphere is turbulent? So we have uh, something called adaptive optics. Um, so the uh, concept is actually quite simple. Um, receive light from the sky, uh, compensate for the turbulent atmosphere, and get a sharp picture. Um, so, but you do need to have something that tells you what to focus on. So we have various methods that are usually uh, involve shining uh, laser beams upwards to make uh, spots glow in the upper atmosphere. And then we have enough information to focus better. <clears throat> so the idea we've been working on is what about a satellite in space that could shine down on the telescope and you could focus on that. So that's a promising idea. And I think it could develop uh, into something we'll all want to use in the future. So here's a picture uh, illustrating that idea. A little satellite uh, way up there in space. It's about 180,000 kilometers up, <laughs> shining down on the telescope. Um, and this is an even more radical idea. Suppose that you could fly a star shade to cast a shadow of a star on the telescope on the ground. Then what could you do with that? The answer is you could see a solar system five parsecs away in a one minute exposure very clearly. So that's pretty enchanting too. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, star shade in question has to be about a hundred meters across, which is not, not constructible today. So let me wrap up here and uh, ask for questions.
Okay, Professor. So uh, before we proceed, let me ask uh, for everybody to turn on their microphones for a huge round of applause in retribution for this wonderful webinar. Okay, so you, as you have seen, I mean, we have a lot of people attending you, more than a hundred people, if we add up people from this room and the, in the YouTube. So uh, be, while people uh, prepare for their questions, we already have some questions. Uh, let me give you a panorama of the audience uh, you had. So uh, we have people from all the five uh, different regions uh, in which Brazil is divided. Right, more than uh, 15 states in our capital. So in the north region, we have people from uh, Pará, obviously where I'm speaking from, but also from Amapá. In the northeast, the states of Maranhão, Paraíba, Pernambuco, Rio Grande do Norte, Sergipe. In the center west region, we have the capital uh, of Brazil, uh, Brasilia, but also people from Goiás in Mato Grosso. From the southeast, Southeast, we have people from Minas Gerais, Rio de Janeiro, and São Paulo. And from the south, we have people from all the three states, Paraná, Rio Grande do Sul, and Santa Catarina. Obviously, uh, we have uh, people uh, from our university, undergrad, graduate students, uh, postdocs, teachers, and professors. Not only people uh, from physics, but from other areas like geophysics, mathematics. Uh, we have people not only from the city of Belém. Pará is already a very big state, right? So um, not have only people from Belém, but also from cities like Ananindeua, Castanhal, Santarém, Santa Isabel do Pará. I know these names are uh, unusual for you. And obviously we have people uh, from uh, many uh, universities, institutes, uh, research centers and observatories all around Brazil. Uh, students, uh, postdocs, teachers, uh, researchers, and professors. Uh, we have uh, also people from abroad attending us. Uh, so we have the honor to have here Professor Atsushi Gushi from uh, University of York, <laughs> Professor Barry Barish, uh, and Professor John Friedman from the United States, and also uh, people attending from other uh, countries like uh, students that are in Portugal at this moment. So, uh, as I said, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, a question. The first question comes from uh, Satish Kuma, PH, that is attending from uh, Hugh. From, uh, Hugh. Okay, sir. So. Okay, thank you, sir. Luis. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Matter, for your talk. Happy New Year. Um, <laughs> the, the, the last time I heard you talk, I attended your talk, was in 2013. Uh, I was a graduate student at Baylor, and you visited us to inaugurate a building. I don't know if you remember uh, going to Waco, Texas. Um, you had lunch with our research group, and uh, you gave a talk. At that time, JW, uh, the, the James Webb was in the initial, sta initial stage of assembly. I think you had just installed MIRI at that time, I guess. Um, so now it's, I, I find it very poetic and fitting to listen to you after it's being launched. Um, <laughs> so with that said, uh, my, my first question is, um, Yes, you said there are a few, like 20 programs, right? So for, for uh, the first year. What's the first thing that you are going to observe using uh, James Webb? Because uh, just, just to preface this, like Kobe, uh, you, you are team, the, the, the FIRAS, right? So for FIRAS, you, you produce the most beautiful BlackBerry curve ever, including the laboratories, right? So it's the most uh, perfect black, BlackBerry curve. So what is the first thing that you are going to do with uh, James Webb? That's my first question. Oh my goodness! Well, oh my goodness! I, well, I, am, I do not know. I do not very, know the very. Um, we may need to turn off a microphone. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so um, we have not announced what the first targets are going to be. Uh, the first thing we have to do is to focus the telescope on a bright star. We hope that it's uh, just very simple, and all we see is a star. Um, the uh, the commissioning program for the instruments will include some uh, some fascinating, uh, scientifically valuable things, but we have not chosen which ones they will be that we will tell you about. Uh, so uh, it's not been announced yet which will be first. <laughs> okay, so then it's a, it's a surprise. Uh, my, my second question is, in, in the sun shield, you have like six layers, right? So six are uh, 
uh, six layers. So what, what's the temperature gradient that they can withstand? What's the material that Sunshield is made of? Yeah, actually there are five layers and uh, the uh, sun facing surface is uh, quite hot. Um, it's not quite up to boiling temperature, but almost. Um, so, and the cold surface is down around 70 Kelvin or 50 Kelvin. It's uh, got radiance, it's not the same everywhere, but it's uh, an extremely effective sunshade. Thank you. What's the material with uh, it? The sunshade is uh, Kapton, which is uh, like the Mylar that you get uh, um, uh, soft drink bottles, uh, only it's an aerospace version. And it's coated with metal to uh, keep the uh, infrared and, and heat from going through. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Satish, for your questions. Thank you, Professor Dometa, for your answers. So uh, the next question uh, comes uh, as a curiosity from a student. Uh, he's, uh, he has wrote down in Portuguese uh, here in the chat, so I will translate it to you. So. Professor, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a curiosity about uh, the date chosen for the launch. So it's Christmas, right? So yes, can you might. tell him, please? Yes, uh, well, um, we wanted to launch it much sooner, uh, but we encountered all kinds of little uh, problems and uh, we gradually uh, solved them all and we were finally ready to go on Christmas Day. So um, it's just a coincidence that that's how it turned out. And uh, we're very appreciative that uh, the launch crew was willing to work on that day because it was a conclusion of a tremendous effort. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Enrique, uh, for your question. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. So uh, the next uh, question comes from, from YouTube. So it comes from... Uh, Professor Ricardo Sturani from the International Institute of Physics. He has written, uh, I understand uh, that uh, it is not among the goal of James Webb Space Telescope, but could it see galactic neutron stars emitting at low temperature, like for instance, below 10 to the five Kelvin, could it detect a population of them? Hmm. I don't know uh, what we should see uh, if there is a population of them. Um, the, we, we certainly would not see the neutrons, but uh, a neutron star is usually so small that it cannot be seen uh, directly. Uh, we find them by determining their gravitational effect on other things. Or uh, some neutron stars are pulsars, so they spin very rapidly and their magnetic fields uh, cause radio emission. Uh, there are a few that are hot enough to observe to uh, emit X-rays. So, um, but there, it's very hard to see them uh, with uh, ordinary visible light. Okay, okay. Thank you, Ricardo, for your question. Thank you, Professor uh, John Meadow, for your answer. So, uh, the next question uh, comes from uh, somebody in this room, but uh, I believe he's without audio and asked me to read it. So, he wrote down, it's, it's our uh, graduate student here, Juan Lima. He has written a great presentation, Professor Meta. I wonder if any of the spectroscop spectroscopic stages are sensitive to polarization information. I imagine such massive targets could be anisotropic, and that kind of data would be quite insightful. We actually do not have a polarization measurement capability. Uh, we talked about it, and the uh, scientists argued that it was more important to have more choices of wavelength filters than to have polarization. So that's what we have. Uh, but you are not the only one who wishes to have polarization information. Okay, okay, thank you, Juan, for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for your, your answer. So, uh, uh, you have mentioned, and indeed you were right, I mean, so although Brazil is, is very huge, right, uh, I, I am speaking from a place that is basically close, very close to the Kuru 
uh, uh, base where in the French Guiana where uh, it has been launched. In fact, uh, just as a curiosity, you know, uh, some years ago, some pieces of the Ariane rocket uh, were found floating, you know, in, in, in river shores near Belém in cities like uh, uh, Salinas and, 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 and other places. Because, I mean, it falls in the ocean, but obviously the tide brings it uh, uh, to the coast. So it's uh, as a curiosity. So uh, you, you have mentioned, uh, I, I was really impressed about the image you have shown in particular uh, with the Eagle Nebula, the pillars of creation, as you mentioned, right? Uh, how infrared, an infrared image can be quite different, right? So, uh, and uh, well, I really uh, was in, impressed about that. So, uh, uh, so the idea is then uh, to have, so other, do you have other, so uh, which other instruments uh, which uh, can give very nice clues of what you're expecting to have? So infrared uh, uh, instruments already available that can give you some kind of hints, uh, uh, has given you for what to look for. Yeah, so um, the choice of where to look is actually the big strategy question for the whole mission. And so uh, we do that by having proposals. People have an idea that their object can be well observed with a particular instrument on the web. And they send us a little book and they say, this is the idea and this is why it's a good idea. So um, in particular for this case, if you want to see you know, through those dust clouds, you want the in mid infrared capability, the longest wavelength that we can offer. And so we do expect those uh, to be uh, very different pictures. By the way, uh, for a nearby object like the Eagle Nebula, the signals are very bright. It should not take very long to make a measurement that's very informative. And we have a spectrometers in there as well, so we can get a uh, uh, spread out the light of a particular interesting spot into the, into the rainbow and say, what are the constituents and what are the temperatures of those particular objects? Some of them should be new stars. Uh, forming inside those dust clouds. And so this will be a first chance to really see them well. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, you, so uh, it has kind of already been asked by, by Satish before, but uh, so do you have kind of preferred targets to look for? I mean, you yourself a while, I mean, all these years of... Uh... Yeah, so I'm not actually observing with this observatory. Um, I viewed it as my function to make it available to everyone. Uh, so, um, so, but I'll tell you what I think is interesting, especially. Uh, number one, uh, in the cosmology area, uh, we know there's a problem about the early universe. Um, that recent measurements of the Hubble constant, the expansion rate, uh, are, are getting so precise that the different methods of measuring it do not agree. And so this says maybe the interesting part is is in the universe itself. Maybe the, <clears throat> the uh, expansion rate has been changing in a way that we didn't expect. Uh, some uh, additional kind of dark energy. So that's one explanation. Uh, another story would be, well, we just made a mistake. Or another one is that the universe has, has uh, fooled us in some way. So something's interesting about that. Uh, the other thing where I think uh, satellites uh, surprises could appear would be in uh, planets themselves. Um, we have been surprised every year about the properties of planets. Uh, first, the uh, discovery of very hot and bright planets orbiting very close to their stars, which led to the Nobel Prize uh, for Mayor and Kettles. Um, so that was a big surprise. Uh, now, uh, another surprise is that there are no solar systems out there that look like ours yet. We've been looking and looking, and we have thousands of them in the box, but none of them look like home. So why is that? Nobody knows. So um, maybe we make some we make some progress on that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I think Satish has uh, has other questions. So please, Satish, go ahead. Thank you, Luis. I have lots of questions, but I have to contain myself. Um, so the, the, the farthest star that we know, individual star that we know is Icarus, right? So through gravitational lensing, we know it's, it's like 14 billion light years from us. So um, 
can, uh, obviously we can see further than that using uh, James Webb, right? So do, do we have the like, candidates for the most infrared farthest uh, stars uh, other than mm. the <laughs> Actually, no, um, nobody's ever seen them be before. Uh, so we have a list of the most distant quasars and galaxies that were found by Hubble. And uh, as far as we know, there's uh, nothing beyond that until we look. So uh, Webb Telescope is such more, so much more powerful in the search for the very distant objects that we maybe get 10 or 100 times as many as the Hubble could find. So uh, we'll see what we find. It's an open question. It's an open question. So when you say first stars, it's really first. <laughs> first time that we are going to see and first time first to be formed, right? That's, so. that's right. And that's right. And, and they are hard to find. They are not very common and they're very faint. Uh, so, and even after you found one, you have to prove that it is a star from the distant universe and not some little uh, asteroid nearby. Speaking about the uh, instrument, since you have a very large uh, sunscreen, don't you think you have a larger area of cross section for something to be hit? So, uh, how is that can be can be avoided? Is there any way? Uh, yes, uh, there will be holes in the sunshade. Uh, that's the reason that we have five layers of the sunshade, so that it will still work even if it has holes in it. Uh, there will be holes in the mirror. Uh, but that's not probably a problem. Uh, in fact, there are many telescopes on the ground that have holes in the mirror and they work just fine. Uh, so we don't think it's a problem, uh, but of course we'll be watching. One last question, I'll make it fun. So since you said you can take a picture one square centimeter on the moon, can't you take a picture of the Apollo landing site and then put an end to the conspiracy theories with the James Webb, please? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Actually, no, we can't uh, observe a, an object on the moon. Um, and the sensitivity that I referred to was a, a, a small object uh, floating in space. Um, so uh, we could not observe something on the moon because it's too bright. Uh, and uh, we also cannot point in the direction of the moon. Uh, too close to the sun. Too close to the sun. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Satish, very much. Thank you, Professor John Mather. So uh, another question comes from uh, John uh, Rojas. Uh, he's in the room. So John, would you like to turn on your microphone and make the question yourself? Okay, thank you, Professor. Um, my, I, I... Okay, uh, maybe he had some problems with the microphone, so let me, so interrupt me, John, if you, if you can speak at any time, okay? Otherwise, I will read your question. So he says, congratulations on your presentation, Professor. Uh, does the telescope ha have some degree of artificial intelligence for navigation, which allows it to maintain itself in the event of an occasional or accidental disconnection with the bases on the ground, or uh, in the event of having to avoid the collision with an object. Uh, and second, what do you think would be uh, the most optimistic and unexpected discovery that could have wished to come with James Webb Telescope about your, I mean, your major interest, essentially? Yeah, OK. Um, about artificial intelligence, um, we have uh, basically one thing that we do in case of something unexpected. Uh, the uh, biggest hazards what we face are electronic, as far as we know. Uh, so I, if the computer fails, which is not unusual for computers, uh, then the telescope will become safe, which means it knows to protect itself from turning in the wrong direction. It would be very unsafe if the sun were able to shine on any part of the telescope. So that's what we call a safe mode for the observatory. And, uh, and, it, and basically, all space observatories have this behavior. So it's a, it's a, a very low amount of artificial intelligence. Um, we do not worry about the orbit uh, very much. The, uh, uh, 
we have to send commands every 10 or 20 days to change the orbit uh, because the orbit is a little bit unstable. Uh, so we will watch that from the ground and determine the orbit. Uh, the observatory does not itself know its position very well. We have to tell it where it is. Okay. So uh, thank you, John, for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor John Mello, for your answer. Uh, Ricardo is now in the room. He, Professor Ricardo Sturani from Rio Grande do Norte. And uh, he wants uh, to make another question. So please, uh, Ricardo. Thanks. I just wanted to follow up. So, yes, it was said um, that uh, neutron stars are visible down to um, their X-ray emission. My question was exactly, so can James Webb Telescope go below, go down to visible emission of nearby neutron stars or not? Ah, so I think our answer is yes, we can look at them, but we don't think we will see them. Um, I don't think there are any proposals to look directly at neutron stars. The, uh, nearest one that would be interesting would be, of course, the one in the Crab Nebula. So maybe somebody will look at that one. I don't know what the plan is for that. Um, Thanks. Since it uh, spins around at uh, a very high rate, what is it, 300 hertz or something to the spin period frequency of the Crab Nebula neutron star, um, that's much too quick for our detectors to follow, uh, but we might still be able to find something. I hope somebody's looking, because it's no, easy I, for me to give an answer, but uh, it's different to measure. No, no, I was not talking about the, um, the radio emission, no? because if you look at the distribution of the intro star, then there is this cut, basically. Uh, some luminosity, you don't see any more of them because of, because of uh, observational bias, of course. So then you could see fainter, uh, electromagnetically fainter neutron star, Basically, the idea was that if you see that the, the curve of um, luminosity doesn't go down indefinitely, but as a plateau, then it could be the sign of something reheating them, like dark matter. But this is very exotic, I understand. The main object of James Webb. Well, if you think we should observe it, then maybe you should write us a proposal. Okay. Thanks. No, we have a paper on that, but a few years ago, it was science fiction then. Now, maybe in a few years, it might not be science fiction. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, for your question. Thank you, Professor uh, John Meadow, for your answer. So uh, uh, Cody Chu uh, raised his hand. So uh, Cody, uh, I don't know if it's the wrong pronunciation of your name. So uh, please make the question yourself. If you can just uh, say from where you're speaking, that will be great. Oh, hi, I'm from uh, UW Milwaukee. And uh, I have a question that you just mentioned, we don't uh, really know that the observatory itself don't know its position very well. And we, we tell them from, from the ground and how we actually check its position. Like we don't have GPS apparently. So how do we do that? Thanks. Yeah, um, it's true that we don't have GPS at that distance. Um, the best thing we do is similar in concept. We measure timing, um, just as the GPS system does. But we measure the time for, for signals to get from the observatory to ground stations. And as the ground stations orbit around, as, well, as the ground stations move, as the Earth spins, and we observe from different places on the Earth, we can uh, calculate the geometry uh, that way. So uh, we solve uh, for the orbit parameters based on timing of the signals to the ground stations. OK, thanks. Well, thank you, Cody, for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor. So uh, uh, one of the, the webinars uh, that I attended from yours <laughs> before this one, obviously, uh, well, you, uh, you mentioned the fact that impressed me a bit that, I mean, uh, unlike the Hubble telescope, as you said, right, if something goes wrong, right, I mean, there's ob obviously the possibility of sending a mission to correct it. Obviously, without the space shuttle, it's, it was going to be a little more difficult, right, these days. It also called me the attention of the launch from the Kourou basis uh, 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 in French Guiana. So uh, obviously, I mean, uh, I, I, if you could say some words about that, when the, that decision was, was made, I mean, uh, along the path. But uh, 
So uh, I was thinking about a possible life extension, right? I mean, so you said about 10 years. Obviously, when, when uh, Hubble telescope was launched, I don't think they believed, right, that, that it would be still working of kind of, you know, after 30 years, right? And, and at the same time, Hubble gave so much for us that, uh, I mean, it's really, really impressive. So uh, can you think, I mean, were you thinking about some kind of giving a, a operation life a extension to the James Webb or... I mean, it would be really better to think about launching another uh, uh, space telescope with uh, further technology. Could you say some words about that? Please? Yes. Uh, of course, when we started designing the observatory, there was no hope, uh, no possibility of uh, visiting it. And people ask often, well, why didn't you put it together in low Earth orbit and then send it up? Um, and the answer on that one is uh, it's a very violent ride uh, even on a small rocket to get from low earth orbit to Lagrange point. And uh, why did you have to have a Lagrange point? Well, because in the low earth orbit, the telescope cannot get cold enough. So uh, many things drive us to this very difficult engineering choice. Uh, now um, there is a rocket being built that is capable in principle of carrying an astronaut far enough to do something. Uh, and so astronaut could go out there and visit it uh, either uh, service it or, uh, or remotely touch it with a robot. Uh, so we, we did one thing. We said, we will paint a pattern on the end of the observatory so that a robot camera could recognize the pattern and know what to do when it gets there. Uh, so we took one step, but our, the major thing we did was to make sure we never need to do this. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, there is another question from the audience. This time comes again from an undergraduate, a local undergraduate student, Gab Gabriel Ribeiro. Gabriel, uh, do you want to make the question yourself? Turn on your microphone and make the question yourself. Yes, I, I believe I can do it. So, hello, Professor. I, I know that the, the James Webb Telescope is brand new, but I, I'm still curious about the future. So I know that the, the telescope has had to deal with a lot of physical constraints uh, because of our launching capability. But there is projects like uh, of some big cargo rockets like Starship that could basically leave these kind of physical constraints in the past. So I was really curious uh, if the astronomy community is considers, considering such projects and if those projects can uh, give us an edge over the James Webb telescope in, in the near future. Okay, uh, good question. Um... Yes, uh, when uh, rockets get to be bigger and cheaper, we at NASA are very happy because then we can fly uh, something uh, more ambitious for the telescope. So we do have one uh, telescope that's being built now that will come next for, for NASA. It's called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. It's a smaller telescope than Webb, but it observes 100 times as much sky at one time. So it will be able to survey a lot of sky. We're looking for signs of uh, dark energy and the dark matter uh, from that observatory. So it's planned for about 2026 uh, launch. So only four or five years from now. Uh, so that's soon. The next great observatory after that, we do not know what it will look like. Uh, astronomers said uh, they would like to have a telescope that's about the size of the web but uh, more accurate and capable of seeing Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. So this is an extremely challenging optical design question uh, because the sun is 10 billion times as bright as the Earth. So that means uh, whatever uh, optical system is built, it must be extremely perfect. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's not bigger than six meters. So we don't think we can afford a bigger telescope than six meters right, for the next thing. Uh, we can draw them, but we can't afford to build them. 
I see. Well, uh, thank you very much for the answer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your answer. Uh, so, Professor, uh, I know uh, uh, you have a time constraint. So maybe just uh, before we finish, uh, uh, I know you already mentioned that, but uh, can you uh, tell us uh, when uh, should we expect uh, the first images and, and uh, uh, which will be the, the, the first targets or some, if you have a, a, already a scheme, can you just say some few more words about that for us to kind of conclude? Yes, uh, well, the uh, commissioning plan that I showed you uh, very graphically is supposed to take six months. So that means if we're on schedule, then uh, June 25th is the date we should be finished. So uh, of course, there's too much to do to be able to promise a day by day, hour by hour, uh, but that's the plan. Uh, so early July of uh, this year is when we should be able to show you our first results. Okay, Professor, and we are very anxious to, to see these first images and I'm sure I mean, this is, I mean, having heard all you have told us, I mean, I'm sure that this first image will be something really, really, uh, I mean, uh, uh, will be kind of lifetime achievement for some people that have dedicated a great part of their career to this project, to this wonderful project. So, Professor, before we finish, uh, so, uh, Naresh, do you have a last question? Uh, do you want to make a question? Uh, maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor, for for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm also from UW Milwaukee. Uh, yeah, while going through uh, question answers and going through all the physics, uh, we we talked about, uh, uh, and this topic is also like in, in interest of mine. Although currently we are focusing on a very large object, but uh, in future, in future would we be able to like with precision uh see scattering uh of any 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 radiations by any compact object like would we be able to have such such cross section or such 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 uh uh detectable uh instrument uh, we can design for 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 scattering of any field around around any compact object like est uh for that, uh, we had to use all the radio telescope. Uh, thank uh, you. Yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, you're asking uh, about compact objects, uh, which are very hard to study uh, because compact means uh, very little light comes from them or can be blocked by them. So a uh, web telescope is not the perfect tool for that. Um, if you want to find uh, Evidence for compact objects, uh, we have to study a lot of sky at once. And so um, you might say, how would I know if a, uh, a small black object was crossing the sky? Uh, and I would need a camera that would be able to say it blocked a star, something like that. That's a very hard project. And I don't know anyone who is really trying to do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Norris, for a question. Uh, thank you, Professor, once again. So before we conclude, let me ask everybody to turn on their microphones once again for a final round of applause in retribution for this, for this webinar. webinar. Thank you. Thank you.